Howdy, I'm Butch. I blog at PoseidonAwoke.wordpress.com. Sargon of Akkad recently did a video about the alt-right entitled An Honest Look at the Alt-Right. This is my response. I have enjoyed several conversations with individuals and groups of people who identify as alt-right, with the intention of understanding what this movement is. The following is an attempt to examine honestly and objectively what I have discovered to present an accurate description of the movement's main concerns, methods, and goals. The phrase alternative right was coined by Richard Spencer in 2010 and has become an umbrella term to describe a neo-reactionary movement to push back against progressive domination of political and social spheres. This is done by creating an idea space in which issues such as race and nationalism can be discussed without considering left-wing positions on the subject. This puts the alt-right outside of mainstream conservatism, which is dominated by left-wing philosophies on the subject of race, nationalism and gender relations, which is summed up in the alt-right by the pejorative label conservative. I created this graph to map out collectivism from the most abstract to the most physical. It is natural, it is normal, human, it is evolved behavior for primates, for humans to organize into groups for their own benefit. We organize into groups for the, only for the reason that it increases our, our fitness in the Darwinian sense. We leave behind more offspring. Our genes are propagated more and better if we organize into groups and we cooperate. Therefore, we have evolved this behavior. I call this behavior of organizing into groups collectivism. Humans tend to very naturally, just like uh, primates do, organize along genetic lines. We share genes with others, our parents. We share 50% of our genes with our parents. We share 25% of our genes with our grandparents. We share genes with these people and therefore we want to cooperate because we share the same genes. Uh, from an evolutionary view, we are propagating the same genes. Therefore, we have a vested interest to cooperate with each other. On the far left side of this graph, we see abstraction. We can cooperate uh, based on ideas. And the reason why we do this is purely for power. The bigger the group we can create, generally, the more competitive we are against other smaller groups. So this is the reason why we have seen abstract group definitions come into being. Because if we can organize a very large group of humans uh, to act in a united manner, they can simply outcompete other groups. There is nothing moral or magical about organizing uh, in an abstract way versus organizing in a physical way. There is only competitive advantage. So I want to get rid of the, the moralizing about this and understand that that's what we're talking about is competition between groups and competitive advantage. The area that I've highlighted in red here, this is what we are allowed to talk about, and we are allowed to talk about it for supposedly moral reasons. The group that is dominant right now, the left, the group that is in charge, has been able to limit the discussion to declare that it is immoral to talk about any type of organization of humans which is not purely ideological or religious. We are allowed to talk about universalist religion. We can talk about Christianity. We can say there is neither Greek nor Jew, that we are all brothers in Christ. We are allowed to talk about uh, communist ideology, that we there are really no divisions between us at all, that uh, the, all, the, all we have are socially constructed divisions which must be destroyed so that we can get to an even more perfect universalist uh, idea of, of how we can work together in a, a in a global way, you know, this Star Trek universe that they want to create. We can also talk about this from a capitalist perspective, where we take uh, divisions of humans completely out of uh, out of the equation, and we look at humans merely as human resource widgets. So uh, the GDP of the United States is going down because the native population isn't breeding. Well, I guess we need to bring in more human resource widgets, right? These, the, these are, this is all acceptable. We can talk about uh, universalist uh, ideas, religions, ideology. As long as the premise, the basic premise is that all men are created equal and that we are going to get rid of all differences so that we can unite together in one large group for power, that's acceptable. The same thing with uh, Proposition Nation, the idea that America is just a bunch of people who believe an idea, 
right? That this is perfectly acceptable to the left. And again, this is because this is their reproductive strategy. Uh, so that they've decided that we can talk about being a united people because we believe the same thing. That's the proposition nation of America. Now let's look at the region in blue. This is ideas that there are actually uh, genetic relationships between humans and that humans who share genes will cooperate with one another for competitive advantage. This is what we on the alt-right are not supposed to be talking about because it would disrupt the universalist abstract competitive strategy that is dominant. The phrase alternative rights was coined by Richard Spencer in 2010 and has become an umbrella term to describe a neo-reactionary movement to push back against progressive domination of political and social spheres. This is done by creating an idea space in which issues such as race and nationalism can be discussed without considering left-wing positions on the subject. I don't think it's fair to say that we don't consider left-wing positions on subjects. Uh, left-wing positions on subjects are dominant. They are the dominant narrative. So we have to understand the left-wing positions on these subjects. What we do on the alt-right is we refuse to allow the moralizing of the left to prevent us from actually looking at the physical reality of the world and to determine if there are other ways to organize our society that are uh, beneficial to us. Hopefully I've made it clear by now that the left's insistence that we not see group differences caused by evolution is simply delusional and is part of their evolutionary strategy. It doesn't mean that they're right. It just means that that's what benefits them. So that's why they try to control what we can talk about and what we can think about. This laissez-faire attitude towards points of ideological disagreement is certainly vital to the cohesiveness of the alt-right, and would probably cause its disintegration into many splinter movements if one ideological position became dogmatic and gained hegemony over all potential alt-right idea spaces. This is important because the alt-right is not, as they will tell you at great length, a single homogenous movement with a streamlined set of beliefs, although there are a certain select set of issues on which there is common agreement. If there is a single point on the alt-right that we agree on, it is that we are not going to be bound by the moralizing of the left. The left is attempting to control the situation. They're trying to tell us what we can and cannot think and telling us that anything outside of their uh, dictated boundary is immoral and evil. We reject this notion because it is nothing more than their competitive strategy. It's to their advantage to define what is good and evil. Instead, we've decided that we're going to think for ourselves and look at reality and decide for ourselves what is right and wrong. This is the central defining feature of the Dark Enlightenment, the rejection of the leftists' ability to define what we can think about and what we can talk about. When you look at uh, ethno-nationalists, they refuse to say that we can't build nations based on biological realities. When you look at HBD, it's people that are saying, hey, we're going to look at evolution and try to understand what that means. People that are interested in femininity or masculinity, we're going to look at actual what are the gender differences in humans and we're going to talk about it. And what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to build political philosophies. We're going to try to build uh, social systems that are based in reality and that are not based in uh, religious ideas uh, or ide ideologies which are just patently uh, false because we understand that the central tenet that all men are created equal, this equalitarian tenet of leftism, yeah, it's great if you want to organize people into large groups because then there are no divisions intellectually whatsoever. But the problem is that we have this little thing called evolution, and it has actually made us different. So maybe the Star Trek universe that they want to build is not possible. Maybe we need to actually use a little bit of science, use some of our understanding about evolution, about human behavior, and try to build some functional systems based on reality. But there is a general consensus that appears to be that since the regressive left has decided to make racialism a key issue, and have decided to back one side of it, the side that can accurately be termed as anti-white. My concern is, uh, is doing away with whiteness. Whiteness is a form of racial oppression, sure. The suggestion is that it is somehow possible to separate whiteness from oppression, and it is not. There can be no white race without the phenomenon of white supremacy. If you abolish slavery, you abolish slaveholders. 
In the same way, if you abolish racial oppression, you do away with whiteness. Treason to whiteness is loyalty to humanity. Noel Ignatiev is a perfect example of why we see an increase in ethno-nationalists. We see that uh, people like him uh, are trying to organize the non-whites within the American democracy against the whites. This is the reason why I say that multiple polities cannot exist within, within the machinery of one state because they end up fighting for the machinery of the state. And this is exactly what we see in America. We see that the Democrat Party is a rainbow coalition, meaning that it is created up of all of the uh, non-white polities, basically, who, who all overwhelmingly vote Democrat. And then the Republican Party is the party of white people. This is uh, exactly the phenomenon that I say exists, that in democracies and in big advanced democracies, you uh, have multiple groups who do not share genetic interests, and then they end up simply fighting for control of the machinery of the state. Two, white genocide. Yes, in advanced democracies like in America and throughout the West, we see that the minority polities, the non-white polities, are organizing together in order to attempt to take over the control of the machinery of the state. And we also see that capitalists are allowing this to happen because they do not view their people uh, within the state as anything worth protecting. They see them as purely human resource widgets. Because whites have a lower birth rate than many of these immigrating non-white populations, then yes, it, it, this is going to result in white people being displaced out of their homelands. It is also perfectly reasonable for white people to attempt to alert other white people that this phenomenon is happening, and that's exactly what the use of the term white genocide is supposed to do. Because one of the most common alt-right beliefs is that without the white race, there can be no Western civilization. 3. Race is culture. Almost all of the alt-rights believe that there are certain types of high-level advanced cultures that are capable of being created and sustained only by certain biological groups of humans. Yes, I believe that this is true, that different populations create different types of societies. If you look up the term gene culture coevolution, which is also called dual inheritance theory, you'll see that genes will, uh, the genotypes that are expressed will, or the people that are there will build a culture. And then that culture will feed back and it will select for er various other genes within the population. And in this way, there is a feedback loop between genes and culture. Another way to look at this is what we call magic dirt theory. There are people who think that just because you move a population of people into America or just because you move them into the West that they will suddenly become Westerners. But we have found out that this is not what happens. Look at South Africa, for example. You took a bunch of uh, Northwest Europeans. They created a civilization in South Africa that looked European. It was a, it was a first world uh, civilization. Now look at the civilization now that it has been handed back over to the natives. We are seeing uh, dramatic changes happening in their ability to produce, uh, in their ability to uh, keep their society stable. You can also look at this on smaller scale by looking at, say, Detroit. In the 1950s, Detroit was almost completely white. It was also one of the most advanced first world cities on the planet. Now Detroit is about 82% black, and we have uh, a vast majority of people there who can't pay their own uh, water bills or who can't create clean water for their own people. Yes, there is a relationship between the people who live in a location and the culture that they produce. Number four, national segregation. Naturally, due to the previous factors, the alt-right is consistent in the desire for racial segregation by nation. That's one way to phrase it. Again, I would phrase it that in advanced democracies, we consistently see the phenomenon of multiple smaller polities joining together in order to uh, take over the machinery of the state from the majority polity. Therefore, the best way to prevent this from happening is to allow each polity to have their own state so that each polity has its own machinery of its own state. And then the polities do not have to fight internally for control of the machinery of the state. This is known as ethno-nationalism. 5. Anti-immigration. 
Anti-immigration is simply a feature of ethno-nationalism. Once you have gone to the trouble of creating a one state per polity, then if you allow mass immigration without assimilation, you will just get right back into the same situation of having multiple polities fighting for the machinery of the state. Or in the case of Western nations, we will see that uh, nations that have already let in other polities and are having the, the troubles of the other polities fighting the majority for the machinery of the state, allowing a, more immigration is simply going to exacerbate those problems. 6. Collectivism. The alt-right is a collectivist movement that is concerned primarily with the survival of Western culture and the white race. I believe I've covered collectivism sufficiently. I believe that it is an evolved behavior. I believe that it is a cooperative strategy, which increases genetic fitness, which is why it exists. I believe it will continue to exist. I believe that Western peoples, people who view themselves as the children of the West, those who are the descendants of Western civilization, who like Western civilization, are simply going to defend that because that is their reproductive strategy. 7. Authoritarianism. The alt-right contains a strong current of authoritarianism, and many of the policies people in the alt-right actively promote require it in some way. I think simply this is the difference between thinking ideologically versus thinking functionally. Is authority good for the polity? Does the use of authority to enforce certain rules make the society safer and better? If so, then perhaps we should do that. There are other groups that pretend that they don't believe in authority, such as the left, but which are all too happy to use their authority to enforce their reproductive strategy of universalism. 8. Traditionalism. The alt-right is broadly traditionalist, with almost all adherents being traditionalist to some degree, although there is certainly a great deal of variance from person to person, and non-traditionalists are a part of the community. My contention is that the alt-right is made up of people who reject the ideological conformity of the left. The left is made up of a group of people who have used uh, universalist ideas in order, and they use propaganda in order to force everyone within the group to conform to an idea. And then therefore they reject any other divisions within the group uh, no matter what. Their idea is that they'll create their Star, their Star Trek universe by just pretending that there is no such thing as reality by getting together into an echo chamber and then chanting their mantra over and over and over again that we are equal, we are equal, we are equal. So there's a lot of variation of the people that don't believe that. The people in the alt-right, in the dark enlightenment, uh, neo-reaction, etc. There's a lot of variation in thought. So I'm not going to go back over all of Sargon's points so where he's documenting all of this this variation in conclusion i can't agree with sargon that there is some sort of a safe space on the alt-right i simply don't think that's true if anything those of us on the alt-right are united by the fact that we don't have safe spaces we do not have echo chambers where we allow people to take ideological control and then simply repeat their lies in order to uh, create group cohesion Instead, our group cohesion is created by the fact that we are Europeans. We are Europeans who value Western civilization. The alt-right is a big tent. I hope that you found this video informative. I hope that it has broadened your understanding of the alt-right. I'd also like to thank Sargon for making a good faith effort to investigate what the alt-right is. Thanks, Sargon.